The evidence thus far suggests that in the first few minutes after death, consciousness is not annihilated. Whether it fades away afterwards, we do not know. But right after death, consciousness is not lost. Have you ever wondered what happens after we die? Is it the end, or is there something more? Imagine death as a change in our awareness, like moving to a different place beyond what we can understand in our everyday lives. It's like stepping into a new dimension that's hard to describe with our regular words. This journey of transformation touches us all, including the tender souls of children who leave us too soon. What unfolds for them in this mysterious realm? And how does their departure shape our understanding of life's ultimate mystery? I realized that I could even see my physical body. I had that whole white light thing. Death is a transformation of consciousness from this physical domain, which is by and large illusory, to another dimension of existence that is apparently so far beyond what we experience here in the physical realm that we can't even describe it in earthly terms. Picture a big mystery like standing on the edge of the unknown. Some people have actually been to this edge, touched it, and returned with incredible stories. Their tales share a common theme, a journey through a bright gateway. It's like they've taken a trip challenging what we think about life and death, giving us a peek into a reality that goes way beyond what we usually understand. These stories invite us to explore something extraordinary on the other side of what we typically see. I was completely in this coma, but I was aware of everything that was going on around me. I could hear and see and feel everything that was happening. I could feel everything the doctors were doing. They were poking needles into me and um, putting in IV tubes and things like that. And I could see and hear things that were beyond the room that my physical body was in. Almost all people that have had a glimpse beyond the veil of death and have had some encounter with what we as Latter-day Saints would call the spirit world or as Emmanuel Swedenborg would call heaven. But almost all of them speak of the overpowering, overwhelming, all-encompassing, all-consuming sense of love. I also felt something which I can only describe as a feeling of unconditional love. Loving and gentle and okay. Nothing to be afraid of. Picture this. You're on the operating table completely unconscious during surgery. It seems you're in a deep sleep, almost like being temporarily gone. Common belief suggests that when you're unconscious, it's like being in a state of deep sleep or even similar to being temporarily dead. No hearing, no seeing, no feeling. However, here's the mind-bending part. Some people claim to know what's happening around them, even in that unconscious state. How is that possible? It's like being asleep and yet somehow aware of everything. Let's unravel this mystery of consciousness in the operating theater and explore how, in a state that seems so close to being asleep, some individuals still retain a curious awareness of their surroundings, challenging our understanding of what it means to be unconscious. The moment your heart stops beating, of course, immediately blood stops flowing to the brain. 10 to 20 seconds after that event, the EEG or electroencephalogram, which is a measure of brain electrical activity, goes absolutely flat. There is no measurable brain electrical activity. It should be impossible to have any kind of conscious memory at that point in time, and yet, literally by the thousands, people have reported near-death experiences under those circumstances. We simply couldn't get him off the heart-lung machine. Finally, we just had to give up, announce him dead. It had been at least 20 minutes that this man recorded no heartbeat, no blood pressure. He recovered. 
people on the boundary of death, very often declared dead and then pulled back. They describe experiences. We've been able to classify them. They have a structure to them very often. They appear to happen at a point in time when it at least appears scientifically that the brain is not functioning. And he talked about the bright light at the end of the tunnel. The thing that astounded me was that he described that operating room floating around and saying, I saw you and Dr. Catania standing in the doorway with your arms folded talking. And I saw all of these post-its sitting on this TV screen. And what those were, were any call I got, the nurse would write down who called and the phone number and stick it on the. He described that. I mean, there's no way he could have described that before the operation because they didn't have any call. He must have been floating. He was up there. Yeah. He described the scene, the things that there is no way he knew. Grief is an overwhelming, gut-wrenching sorrow that settles in our hearts when we lose someone dear. Yet, when it's the loss of a child, it transforms into an indescribable ache, a pain that feels like our very souls are being torn apart. Losing a child is an unbearable departure from the natural order of life, like a heartstring pulled too soon. The grief of losing a child is piercing and heartrending. It defies the expected flow of life, leaving parents in a state of profound agony. The question echoes in the silent chambers of their pain. Why are these innocent souls taken away so prematurely? It's an inquiry that resonates with the anguish of parents who, in the darkness of their sorrow, search for answers that might never come. In this heart-wrenching reality, we grapple with the unfairness of a world that disrupts the expected order of life. Losing a child challenges the very fabric of our understanding, leaving a trail of emotional devastation in its wake. The pain is not just a wound. It's a raw, emotional earthquake that shakes the foundation of a parent's heart, leaving them to navigate a world forever altered by the absence of their precious one. Amid this heartbreak, the haunting question arises, could this profound sorrow be woven into a grander plan that eludes our understanding? Children who die sub-adult, you know, whether it's even in utero, a miscarriage, or children who die uh, when they're, before they're in their early 20s, they tell us are always very advanced beings. These beings don't really need to come back for a whole lifetime, and it's a lot of trouble to go through a brief lifetime, which is a gift they give to us, but they come specifically so that they're able to give that gift. Um, it's a very important spiritual lesson to lose a child. And so as much as I, when I say this is a gift, you're going to go, oh my God, that couldn't possibly be a gift, especially if you've lost a child. These are always gifts. Your child was a very advanced being and still is, didn't need that experience. And so what your child has done is to give you the great gift of loving and losing so that you can grow spiritually. Grief, with its deep, gut-wrenching sorrow, often leads us to yearn for a connection beyond the tangible, especially when we face the profound loss of a loved one. In the midst of this heartache, there's a flicker of solace, the promise of reunion with those we cherish. The pain of losing someone we love is like a storm that rages through our hearts, leaving us in a sea of emotions. Yet amid the tempest, there's a whisper of hope, the belief that beyond the veil of mortality, a reunion awaits. This promise of union becomes a lifeline for the grieving, a shimmering light on the horizon. In the quest for understanding and healing, we grasp onto the notion that the connection with our departed loved ones transcends the physical realm. It's a promise that suggests our bonds are not severed by death, but transformed into a spiritual connection, an ethereal thread that ties us to those we hold dear. This promise of union becomes a guiding star in the darkness of grief, offering the comfort that, although separated by the tangible, the love and connection endure beyond the limits of our earthly understanding. 
It's a testament to the enduring power of love, whispering that in the vastness of eternity, the bonds we share with our loved ones are not lost, but merely waiting to be rediscovered. Often they become our spirit guides or they otherwise help us during our lives. And when we arrive, they, they're there and they welcome us. I, I'd grown up thinking life's a test and I'm going to be judged and I'm holding my little boy who died because I wrecked the car. You know, I cut his life short because I lost control or dozed off. And suddenly there felt like there was physical arms that wrapped around and just held us. And then there was this download, this, this overwhelming communication. And I was told there's nothing to forgive. There is something much more. There was something bigger, more powerful, more universal, more connected than what we have discovered with science to date. Death is a state that we can have in life because death taught me how to live. And I feel sad that people only find this out at the end of their life. And this is why I share my story. The powerfully positive message of near-death experience, even conceivable for all of humanity, that there is an afterlife, a wonderful afterlife for all of us, is based on a mountain of evidence. Skeptics haven't uh, uh, even begun to explain anything we see in near-death experiences. The concept of death remains a mystery. Is it an illusion? Near-death experiences challenge our conventional understanding of it, making us wonder if it's an illusion. These experiences suggest that death might not be the end, but a transition, opening the door to a broader comprehension of existence. However, grief remains an intense and heart-wrenching undertone amidst these reflections. The hope of reuniting with our departed loved ones adds a hopeful note emphasizing enduring connections and eternal love. Therefore, as we face life's inevitable conclusion, we find a resolute answer. The potential that death is not an end, but a metamorphosis.